welcome to the Rumi Forum. And a thank you to Erkin and others who have provided us with the hospitality that we've shared and this beautiful new space for us to be gathered in. Today we have a special opportunity to hear from Dr. Ian Markham, who's going to give us um, a, a brief talk on, um, I'll try to pronounce the name properly, uh, Bedouizama Said Nursi. I am the Reverend Dr. Carol <coughs> Flett. I'm the Interfaith Programs Coordinator at the Washington National Cathedral, where I coordinate interfaith, interfaith uh, dialogues, primarily Abrahamic dialogues, between Jewish, Christian, and Muslim scholars, as well as um, other grassroots dialogues as well. And I have a particular interest in the Christian-Muslim uh, dialogue and Christian-Muslim relationships. And so I'm delighted to be here as well and to learn from um, Dr. Markham. Dr. Markham is currently serving as Dean and, Pref and President of the Virginia Theological Seminary in Alexandria, Virginia, and as Priest Associate at St. Paul's Church in Alexandria. Prior to Dean Markham's appointment in 2007, he served as Dean and Professor of Theology and Ethics at Hartford Seminary in Connecticut, and as Visiting Professor of Globalization, Ethics, and Islam at Leeds Metropolitan University in the United Kingdom. Uh, Dr. Markham has written two books on Said Nursi. The first was an edited collection titled Globalization, Ethics, and Islam. And the second is forthcoming in its final piece of publication. The title of that is Engaging with Bedouizama, Said Nursi, a Model for Interfaith Dialogue. So I'm looking forward to learning more about Said Nursi and his ways that we can perhaps improve and change the ways that we carry out interfaith dialogue from his learnings. Welcome, Dr. Markham. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the warm welcome to be here. I'm delighted to be here. Um, just a few words uh, about how I uh, established this interest in uh, Ben Jusim and Saeed Norsi. Uh, I am um, a, an Episcopal priest, uh, a, a Christian, uh, and I had the privilege of serving for six years at Hartford Seminary as their academic dean. Hartford Seminary is quite an interesting seminary. It's, it's actually in the student body, one-third Muslim, and uh, probably the only place in the United States with such a high percentage in, in theological education of, of Muslims. And many of these Muslims actually came from uh, the Noor community, and that was actually where my interest. Um, Turkish Islam, um, I'm especially interested in non Middle Eastern forms of Islam. I, mean, I think when we think about Islam, too often we get sort of preoccupied with, with the Arab world and with the Middle East, and we ignore the fact that Indonesia, for example, is the largest and most populated Muslim country in the world by far, and put Indonesia with, say, Indian Islam or, or Chinese Islam, then you have more Muslims in those three countries than you will find throughout the Middle East. Uh, Turkish Islam is, I think, especially interesting for Christians uh, in the West because what you have in, in Turkey is a country which is um, had to adapt to its changing status in the world. It was on the losing side of the First World War. Uh, the Ottoman Empire was then dismantled. Uh, and, and with it, the trauma of all that as a country came to terms with what was happening. You had the emergence of uh, Ataturk, uh, an aggressively secular state, uh, grew and developed. Uh, a remarkable state which wanted to engage with, with westernization and democracy and uh, modern forms of industrialization. So it went through a period of enormous upheaval. And Saeed Norsi was a key conversation partner in all this. And therefore, I think for Christians, especially working in the West, it is a very, very interesting conversation partner. You will find on your seat a, a summary of what I'm going to say. So let me just speak for about 20, 25 minutes, uh, and then we can discuss and, and bring your expertise and thoughts, because I'm very sure, uh, not least, um, our host knows a great deal about Ben Jusim and Saeed Norsi and will be able to share his reflections. I'm sure others will as well. Uh, ben Jusman Saeed Norsi. Ben Jusman simply means wonder of the age. He was born in 1877 and died in 1960. So, as I've already noted, he lived towards the tail end of the Ottoman Empire as the Ottoman Empire was uh, dismantled. Uh, he lived through the First World War. He fought during the First World War. Uh, and it was during that, I think, his horror and fear of war 
uh, very much shaped his, his uh, faith and understanding. He also was a key conversation partner for Ataturk um, and initially was inclined to be sympathetic to the project that Ataturk embarked upon and then became more suspicious of it. And he became suspicious of it because he saw in the ruling elite a real antagonism to Islam, uh, which, he, which worried him. And he wanted to illustrate that you can be a faithful Muslim and live in a secular state. You can be a faithful Muslim and support modernity. You can be a faithful Muslim and find ways of dealing constructively with the West and uh, with issues of diversity within and pluralism within Turkey. Uh, so I find his writings fascinating. The primary source is the Risale in Noor, uh, all of which has now been translated into English. Uh, runs to four volumes, uh, which this is the words uh, I have here, and I think you can find, as you can with everything these days, it all on the internet somewhere. Um, and what was interesting for, for Norsi is that I think he was one of the foremost uh, theorists in, in Turkey, Com committed, devout, observant Muslim theorist who saw that the attachment between Islam and the state uh, can be appropriately challenged. And he talks about that himself as the shift from the old Sayyid to the new Sayyid. A crucial moment was the journey uh, on, in April 1923 uh, when he decided that the issue for, for Muslims in Turkey was less to worry about the caliphate and the relationship of Turkey at a, a national or, or state level and worry much, much more uh, about piety, a love of God, uh, submitting your life to God, living as if God really is. Uh, appreciating the coherence and elegance of Islam, uh, loving the Quran, uh, and, and this, in other words, it became a sort of renewal movement uh, which was going to start less at the state level and much, much more where people were and the challenges they have in their life. And he's a beautiful mixture of a completely uh, traditional Sunni Islamic thinker with, with with Sufism, with a, a real grasp of contemporary Islamic Muslim dynamics. So I'm going to identify four key themes of his thought, and it's difficult to be selective because he touches on everything. I mean, what's interesting about the Rasul al Nur, it's almost a sort of um, thematic commentary on the Quran, uh, and it <coughs> brings together in beautiful uh, ways uh, the certain, certain, around certain themes the key texts and then reflects upon them. Uh, and I think the first thing one, one sees in uh, Saeed Norsi is a commitment to being rooted. Uh, he is not, you, lots of, whenever I'm involved in interfaith dialogues or whenever I'm talking to Christians, they keep asking me about when are we going to find liberal versions of Islam? You know, Sam Harris and that dreadful book, uh, The End of Religion, uh, or whatever it's called, um, Harris muses on, you know, the only hope for Islam is Islam needs to get to a place where it doesn't believe Islam anymore. Well, that's not where Norsi is. Norsi is a person who actually thinks the Quran is true, that Muhammad is indeed the final prophet, that he's completely observant, committed, rooted, in place uh, Muslim. In fact, his initial, uh, the tenth word, as it became known, uh, was a, a tract on the resurrection, defending the concept of the resurrection uh, for the elite. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting illustration of, uh, basically the heart of the argument is that you can't make sense of life in all its complexity without locating it in the context of both belief of God and a life hereafter. And he, he constantly illustrates how your understanding of living and being will be incomplete until you recognize this bigger picture, this larger canvas. And he, he, he uses story and um, illustrations uh, to, to develop that theme. Uh, and, and that was his first, first argument, proofs for the hereafter, proofs for the resurrection. Uh, so part of it's apologetics, defending Islam in the face of uh, skepticism and atheism and a suspicion that perhaps none of this is true and all of it is to be associated with a pre-modern age. Uh, and he, he, um, 
let me just quote uh, his, his reflections on the Quran, um, where he talks about the Quran, uh, the all wise Quran, which makes known to us our sustainer, is thus. It is the pre-eternal translator of the great book of the universe, the disclosure of the treasures of the divine names concealed in the pages of the earth and heavens, the key to the truths hidden beneath these lines of events, the treasury of the favours of the most merciful and the pre-eternal addresses which come forth from the world of the unseen beyond the veil of this manifest world. And so he goes on, that's from the fourth droplet in the words. Uh, in other words, he is not your liberal Muslim in the sense of a Muslim who's skeptical about uh, the truth of Islam. He comes out of that place of rootedness. He comes out of that tradition uh, and he believes fervently in its validity and insights. Uh, he combines that commitment to rationality and the elegance of Islam and the Quran with uh, beautiful piety, which uh, come off the pages. I mean, as a Christian reading this sort of material, uh, you can't help but periodically be swept into moments of prayer as you encounter his reflection on the nature of the creation or uh, the beauty of, of God and God's interaction with nature. Uh, one of my favorite passages is where he's reflecting on the nature of prayer, and he's talking about uh, the Islamic uh, practice of five daily prayers and why it's important and precious. This again is from the ninth word of the volume called The Words. Uh, and he likens, and I think this is, this is lovely, he likens uh, the pattern of five daily prayers to the pattern of reflecting on one's life. So uh, the, the, the initial prayer before sunrise may be likened to spring's birth the moment when sperm takes refuge in the protective worm, or the first of the six consecutive days during which the earth and sky were created. So it captures freshness and new life and starting, uh, uh, st starting again. The time just past midday may be likened to the completion of adolescence, the middle of summer, or the period of humanity's creation in the world's lifetime. The time for sunset reminds us of many creatures decline at the end of autumn and also of our own mortality, of our own death. He thus, it thus forewarns us of the world's destruction, the resurrection's beginning. Um, the, the time at nightfall calls to mind the worlds of darkness. In other words, what he's done is he's, he's, he's inviting a Muslim to see those five daily prayers as a way to actually reflect on all one's own life and also how God is relating constantly with all of creation from beginning through to end. And it, it does actually, as you reflect on this as a sort of way of looking at day and the passing of time, you find yourself actually thinking differently about day and passing of time. You actually do find yourself thinking afresh about the nature of time and the importance of living life in the context of eternity and immortality. I, in, in short, what I find when I read the Rasulullah Nur is live as if God really is. And actually that's quite an important challenge for Christians because Christians are quite good at living as if God might be. <laughs> uh, certainly the mainline tradition of which I'm a part. Uh, but in Nursi you get a very strong sense, live as if God really is, and if God really is, then let it really make a difference to one's life. The second key theme is uh, his attitude to the state, which I think is very, very interesting. Um, he actually um, famously said, 99% um, of Sharia consists of ethics, worship, afterlife, and virtue. 1% of it is related to politics, about which our principal rulers ought to think. And elsewhere he actually writes that when it comes to leadership of a Muslim state or a state predominantly occupied by Muslims, you don't worry about whether your baker is a Muslim or whether your uh, silversmith is a Muslim. Uh, so what you need is good leadership. You need good leadership which can serve the people effectively. If that skill set is found in a non-Muslim, then that's fine. I mean, this is actually quite a striking, for the, for the conversation within Islam, this is quite a striking position to take. 
And yet, he's not indifferent, and no Muslim can be, to how state and nationhood is organized. So you get, throughout his writings, you know, real concerns about usury, uh, real concerns about the poor, uh, the obligation to take care, uh, commitment to justice. So he wants to put pressure on rulers to act in just ways and support those which uh, have least running parallel with also with a strong sense that that is the Muslim contribution to the state, not necessarily that Muslims run the state. And this is, I think, a very distinctive position uh, in the Islamic world. The, the third feature I want to highlight is his commitment to dialogue and nonviolence. Um, uh, there is, he, he talks explicitly about, um, this is from the biography of Said Norsi by Sukran Vahidi, um, where she summarizes his position nicely. The way of the Rasala Nur was peaceful jihad, or jihad of the word, in the struggle against aggressive atheism and irreligion. By working solely for the spread and strengthening of belief, it was to work also for the preservation of internal order and peace and stability in society in the face of the moral and spiritual destruction of communism and the forces of irreligion which aim to destabilize society and create anarchy and to form a barrier against them. It, it's, when, it's cl quite clear that Norsi was deeply committed to nonviolence. Um, I don't think the category pacifist would necessarily apply because uh, that's not how the question would be framed and certainly I think Norsi, as every Muslim, is, is committed to the right of self-defense but the rules he states for self-defense are so, so limited that he definitely thinks that any Muslim who resorts to violence has in a very real sense failed. And, and it's a failure both of belief in God, belief in the providence of God to ultimately make sure that right and good happens, but it's also a failure in the sense of a lack of confidence in the truth, elegance and beauty and the coherence of Islam. So it's, it's like a sort of child who's got a very strong identity and is secure in who they are can then go out in the world and worry less about encountering disagreement or oppositions. When you have that self-confidence, says Norsi, you should be able to interact much more constructively with difference and diversity. And there's a strong commitment in Saeed Norsi's writing to both dialogue and to non-violence. Um, there is a, a saying where he talks about the fact that if you've got a military ship made up of personnel, and on that ship, full of, you know, a thousand soldiers, and on that ship, one child, you're not allowed to sink that ship. So he's got a deep, deep commitment to uh, non-violence and to dialogue. The fourth theme is uh, his conviction that you should learn from modernity, yet resist the atheism of modernity. He very much saw that we were at a time when uh, the people of the book need to form some sort of alliance. Uh, against Richard Dawkins, against Sam Harris, against uh, Christopher Hitchens, against those who really do think that you can make sense of the complexity of this world without reference to any sort of transcendent uh, belief in God. Um, and he, he spent a lot of time talking about the two Europes, one Europe which we can learn from in terms of science and understanding of the world in all its complexity, the other Europe which is attached to materialism and to positivism, which uh, denies the existence of God. So now the, the, the other thing it's important to stress is that this has been a hugely influential movement. I mean, given the literature which has been written on the Egyptian Brotherhood, which probably numbers hundreds in terms of adherents, uh, this is a movement of literally millions. I mean, um, and numbers vary because, of course, people don't join in ways that you can recognizably identify them. But from a conservative estimate of, say, 6 million up to 9 million. So it's a very major Islamic movement in the modern world, which people don't know very much about. But in my judgment, I think it's hugely important for us to know more about it. And, and there are three reasons which I just note at the bottom of your handout. I think that when the interfaith dialogue world and industry thinks about the future, We've got to stop hoping that the way forward is going to be sort of secular humanism, which denies uh, the truths of religion, or even that we're going to have lots of liberal Christians who are um, 
sceptical about the particularities of their traditions. Uh, that's just not where the world's going. I mean, I think it's quite interesting that you know, secularization thesis has, has manifestly failed. I mean, the, the confidence of the 60s and the 70s that with modernity comes uh, decreasing religious participation and identification. That isn't true. I mean, Europe's the exception rather than the rule. America remains counter to that, but also as modernity takes off in places like India and in uh, China and elsewhere, actually, you find that religious propensities are running parallel with some of the growth in these areas. So we've got to live with the truth that religion in its particular forms are with us forever. We're not going to move to a situation where uh, religion is losing its power or effectiveness over people's lives. Uh, and we've got to work with the fact that uh, people want to, if they're going to identify with a religious tradition, actually want to identify with it. In other words, if you're Christian, most Christians want to continue to believe in the Incarnation and the Trinity. If you're a Muslim, most Muslims want to believe in the infallibility of the Quran. If you're a Jew, most Jews want to believe that, in some sense, the Torah comes from God. Uh, if you are, you know, in fact, these forms of religion are where people, in the end, identify and grow into and, ident and, and learn what it is to be religious from. So the reason why I think Saeed Norsi is so fascinating is because he is, to use Alistair McIntyre's phrase, a good example of a tradition-constituted theologian. In other words, he knows he's located and he spends his time illustrating that out of that place of rootedness and location, he's got to illustrate that what the Quran and what the Hadith is teaching is a deep commitment to pluralism, coexistence with difference, dialogue, learning from the best of other traditions, building alliances, while at the same time believing that ultimately Christians are mistaken. And as a Christian, I have no problem with that. But I think that's quite a good place for a Muslim to be. I mean, I don't mind Muslims disagreeing with me about the Trinity and the Incarnation, that's fine. Um, uh, but I am eager to work with them when we can, to build alliances, to have conversations, to commit to peace work together, to commit to building and constructing a better world, to, to, and to work together in the, in the task of, of advocating for faith. So it's a good, and, and in my view, the, what, you, what you have methodologically in Ben Jusim and Saeed Norsi is a good model. I mean, what, what Christians need their own Ben Jusim and Saeed Norsi, somebody who's equally rooted, equally committed to the truths of Christianity, who can therefore speak to those in our own tradition which have problems with religious diversity and pluralism, and illustrate that there are good Christian reasons for constructive relationships uh, with the diversity of, the, of God's uh, providential uh, gift of diversity. Uh, Hinduism needs it. Uh, Buddhism needs it. I mean, you know, all these traditions need people who are clearly belonging and at the same time illustrate that out of that place of belonging, there are good reasons to coexist with difference and diversity. I'm going to pause there and turn back to Carol and just invite any questions or discussion. Thank you very much. Um, just observing you d talking about nursing, you have a lot of enthusiasm and energy and passion. So, um, and not having met the man, but you've, you've experienced him through his writings. Um, um, my question for you, which I sort of posed earlier, is this sounds like he's a person that, um, as you say, every tradition needs a nursing. Uh, but how can other traditions, non-Muslim traditions, discover nursing? in order to apply those principles of finding that person who can bridge the, the, the modernity and the, the religious uh, traditions. Um, so how would, do you have any ideas of how we can bring Nursi to Christians and to Jews? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I'm very interested in the sociology of ideas and uh, how ideas catch on and how certain group become famous and how uh, certain individuals get attention and and I have a sort of suspicion that actually that's quite haphazard. I don't know whether history is always fair to those 
who deserve attention. I'm sure the present is hardly ever fair to people who deserve attention. Um, and I think history often doesn't quite get it right. Uh, and therefore, what libraries are special and precious places. I'm a deep commitment, com deeply committed to the whole phenomenon of the library and, and what it actually does for protecting those. The most important books in the library are, are actually those which are never taken out. <laughs> <laughs> because that makes sure that they, those volumes, are there for somebody to discover in 20, 30 years' time. And of course, there is something that was very interesting. I mean, David Hume, for example, in philosophy was, you know, a, 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 I suppose, a, I mean, his bestseller was The History of England, an odd book written by a Scotsman. And, um, and uh, he made his living throughout his entire professional life as a librarian. Um, and it was actually only thanks to Immanuel Kant that actually he ever really got his status in the history of ideas. So there is something very interesting about that. Now, when it comes to, to Islam, I think we all have an obligation to be very, very careful because I think uh, the people who are doing most to disseminate Western perceptions of Islam are those who are least sympathetic mm -hmm. to peace uh, and constructive relationships with Muslims. Uh, so, so Wahhabi Islam's getting tons of attention. <laughs> uh, Osama bin Laden's getting tons of attention. Uh, the Egyptian Brotherhood's getting lots of attention. You know, uh, lots yeah. of books being written about Al Qaeda. And I think we do need to say, look, hang on, uh, let's mm -hmm. just be a little yeah. fair here, um, and do the exercise of really seeking to understand what's going on inside the Muslim world. We need to actually read more widely. Mm -hmm. uh, so, to put it bluntly, I think a factor in the neglect of Ben Jusim and Said Norsi is Islamophobia. We're not working hard enough to find mm -hmm. out, mm -hmm. you know, who's shaping the lives of, of uh, many Muslims living around the world today. Uh, another factor is, is just sociologically, his, his writings were discouraged, to say the least, uh, by the government of Turkey. Um, Printed editions only appeared, I mean, you can probably give me the precise dates, but in the last 30 years or so, 50s, 1950s. Um, translations came slower. Um, I mean, it's taken some time mm -hmm. for, for this to get, uh, I mean, still in, in English. Uh, studies on Ben Jusim and Said Norsi are relatively few. I mean, five or six collections of essays now. Um, but here you have, an inspiration to literally millions, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. nine millions up there. That's <laughs> bigger than the Episcopal Church right. by several times <laughs> over. Um, um, you know, yeah. it's a significant movement inside Islam, um, and it's deeply committed to nonviolence and dialogue. And I think that, you know, if you take anything away from this presentation, next time somebody says, where are the moderate Muslim voices, or why don't I hear Muslims condemn more often nonviolence? Mm -hmm. You can just say, look, they say these things all the time, and you're just not listening. Mm -hmm. But B, did you know, for example, one of the largest Muslim movements in the world is inspired by a nonviolent dialogical Muslim? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that doesn't mean that he doesn't believe anything about Islam either. It's, you know, it's not mm -hmm. just a, a Western Muslim who's mm -hmm. long since spends all his time in the bar and drinking and, <laughs> you know, this is. <laughs> This is coming out of a real place. Um, so, so I think, yeah, that, that is an interesting question. And I think the answer, in short, is um, partly the way the movement has finally got some space to draw attention to Norsi, partly the translation of his writings, partly the slowness of the academy to take an interest in non-Middle Eastern forms of Islam, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and partly we just find learning about terrorists much more interesting yeah. and we're not it paying attention purpose. to the billion Muslims. Mm -hmm. We're still fixated well, on the minority. And you're in a position as the dean and president of a seminary to be able to incorporate some yeah. of this awareness of both nursing with the, the next generation of preachers and teachers in the Episcopal Church. And, yeah. and hopefully we can, think, and I think your other question I think is very intriguing is who would be a Christian nursery or a Jewish nursery that, that the um, Islamic world needs to hear from. So again, this, we're, the, 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 our conversations are mutually beneficial yeah. because we, we need to have an understanding of each other, not just us, us understanding Islam, but 
a better understanding of Christianity and a better understanding of Judaism from uh, from Muslims as well. Yeah. So. No, I agree with that. Well, let's open it to our, our audience that's gathered here today. See if you have some questions for Dr. Markham. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Um, you mentioned very briefly Hindus and Buddhists. And I'm interested in how the dialogue will be affected if a group of people believes that their belief systems have been revealed, but another group of people, their beliefs have not been revealed, and how that works in that divide. And I think you know so much of our attention has been focused into Jewish, Christian, Muslim dialogues. That's where the hotspots have been. But if you look over toward India, into that region of the world, there are other fault lines that are at work. Mm -hmm and very strong identities and very strong egos also. And I'm wondering how we cross that divide, because that belief will be a barrier. That's a very good question. Um, I, I, was, I delivered the TEAP lectures when I was in India, and I did them on the Hindu-Muslim dialogue primarily. Um, because, of course, that is a huge issue in that country, uh, the, the, the Hindu-Muslim. Did I, what did I say? Hindu, mm -hmm. Hindu-Muslim dialogue, mm -hmm. that's right. Uh, because that's, uh, I mean, that's a significant and difficult relationship to, to I mean, India is a, a beautiful country, a remarkable country, uh, and it is a, it, it's a real question about how the two coexist. And as you know, there has been in, over the last 15, 20 years, a, a fairly aggressive um, backlash against Islam uh, and Christians and uh, and Sikhs uh, by some Hindus who felt that um, they are in the end all invaders. And what I find really interesting about when you look at some of the literature which came out of the BJP, for example, in their early days, um, when, you, when you read that literature, it, the, the primary argument seemed to be the natural religions of India are ones that are deeply inclusive Islam is a non-inclusive tradition, therefore it isn't authentically Indian. I mean, it's a really yeah, interesting, interesting. Sociological it's, it's I mean, it's a very interesting argument, really. I mean, it's slightly paradoxical because, because it's a tradition which doesn't include, we can't include you. I mean, it's a slightly, uh, that form. Now, now, of course, you know, Congress got re-elected and, and so on, so things have moved on and settled down a little bit. But what, what I find quite interesting is that uh, I think you're right to say that interfaith dialogue needs to take seriously the particularities of uh, situation and context. So on the whole, I'm not in favor of generic sort of United Nations interfaith dialogues where we all try to come together, the leaders of world religions, and solve all the problems of the entire world. Because, uh, you know, in the north of Ireland, the conversation was very, very much intra-Christian and you had to understand the particular dynamics between Scotland and Ireland and English and uh, all those sort of, and, and it comes out of a Presbyterian and Catholic and though that's the dynamic in that particular place and setting. Uh, in, in India, it's a, a sort of fear that um, the changes brought about by the imposition of the secular state by the British as it departed and, and so on, created a sort of nervousness about too much change, undermining core historic values in, in Indian society, um, which created part of the backdrop for the conversation which needs to take place there between Hindus and Muslims. Uh, and so therefore I'm much more in favor of what I call contextual dialogues, dialogues which uh, acknowledge place, location, uh, local, uh, focused on the particular dynamics uh, and histories that make up the traditions that need to have those conversations. And then as, as to your second part of your question, namely, is there a fundamental difference between the Abrahamic traditions and non-Abrahamic ones uh, around the concept of revelation? Uh, actually, I, I, mean, I mean, the thing about Hindu th theologies, of which there are thousands of course, and the whole name is a European imposition. And, um, but there's still a very deep commitment to revelation in those traditions, uh, that, that there are, is a text which is in some sense authoritative, 
uh, which shapes the understanding of what's true. Um, so, so actually, I think actually the concept of revelation is shared across. I mean, even in Buddhism, um, you you get that. So, you know, the the, the Buddha made a discovery of a truth which then all of us are invited to participate in. So actually I, I don't think that's necessarily the divide. Is the divide then that some people think they're right and other people think they're wrong? I'm less worried about that divide. I think that that's one divide we've just got to get over. In other words, uh, I have no problems with people meeting who disagree fundamentally. Acknowledge that disagreement, share it, enjoy it, have it out and then just move on, okay, even though we disagree, we've still got plenty of work we can do together, like peacemaking or justice or living together constructively. There's that superb study, which I really do recommend, Artosh Varshney's study, um, social scientist out of Harvard. And it's a really interesting study because it, the question was so sort of obvious, really. He did a study of communal violence in India between Muslims and between, um, well, Hindus and, and non Hindu groups, actually, not just Muslims. And he asked the question, why do some cities erupt and others don't? Especially when those cities have the same percentage of different faith traditions. And the answer he gives is really important for the interfaith dialogue movement to learn. The answer Atosh Varshini gives is this. Those cities which erupt are those which lack formal interfaith structures. In other words, too much can be made of, oh, we all live together happily here, we shop together, you know, we get the milk from the store, you know, everything's fine. Those sort of informal connections. But we've seen that they blow up quite effortlessly in Croatia and, you know, those informal networks don't work. What happens, says, where you've got strong Muslims, Hindus in some sort of structure, be it around business, be it around politics, be it around some sort of structure. And then when there's the provocation, they then are a vehicle through which people connect and calm. And that was it. Structured interfaith organizations is a major factor in preventing intercommunal violence in Indian cities. And I think that that's actually something we need to take much more seriously. Local, contextual, worry less about theological differences and rather more about the immediate context and structures in those places. I wonder if our teaching, because one man's idol could be another man's deity, and vice versa. We need to build in, even if we don't agree with it, a respect for whatever that person's representation is. Yeah, no, I'm all in favor of respect, full stop, yes. <laughs> uh, respect's very important, and of course, um, uh, yeah, no, definitely. Um, I mean, for me, I, I sort of see religious disagreements as analogous to all disagreements. I, I think we overstate the differences. You know, if you put a Democrat and a Republican together and they're disagreeing about, I don't know, whatever, the Iraq war, um, there ought to be still a respect for each other's arguments, certainly respect mm -hmm. for each other people as human beings. Um, you can share the disagreement, you can try and persuade each other, and then if you're not going to persuade each other, you just move on and talk about other things. And that's largely how I see, you know, I disagree with my wife about all sorts of things, and that's how we operate. Uh, I mean, I'm sort of a big fan of Let's not overstate the nature of religious disagreements and let's learn to live with them more effectively. I'd like to comment just briefly on your, um, your report of the, the uh, study in India. Um, because I've had a number of conversations with um, Iraqis who grew up in Baghdad uh, as children where they lived and played with Christians and Jews and people I've talked with from Islamabad who said the same thing. But when there was a change in the political structure, the, you know, there was an eruption of of hostility between the groups. But in those places, they really lacked that formal interfaith structure yeah. that you're recommending. Um, they just didn't, it did, there was a void. There wasn't anything to hold it together once there was a sh shift in the political leadership. Uh, 
So it's a really important lesson um, in our own country as well. Uh, I mean, post 9-11, my experience was in, in uh, Massachusetts where we had a formal interfaith structure in a particular community prior to 9-11. So when 9-11 occurred, we had an immediate method of responding and communicating with each other. Yeah. Um, and so I've, I've learned that personally, but I, have, I want to sub, sort of highlight that recommended formal interfaith structure as a way to maintain harmony in the, in the, in the midst of adversity. Yeah, I agree entirely. Is there anything to sit down and like we're chatting? Mm -hmm. I Can you have a mic? Do I need a mic to ask you? Where's the mic? Okay. No, we're making sure that you're heard on the podcast. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, theologically speaking, it's, um, it's fascinating to me how sort of similar and common the questions about the nature of God are among all these different religions. I mean, they're basic questions. Okay, they're basic questions about the, the fundamental nature of God. You know, the, the same issues of predestinationism versus free will get addressed, and is he, if he's all loving and omniscient, you know, the evil problem. I mean, have, in Norsi's dialogue, is there anything that a Christian would find alien to their concept or understanding of of the nature of God aside from the Trinity? I mean, aside from obviously we think that there are these three in one and that doesn't violate monotheism somehow. Um, could, I mean, could you sort of theologically address it? Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no, certainly. Um, I mean, well, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, the, the uh, Thomas Aquinas, the great Dominican friar of the 13th century, of course, gets credit for probably thinking through with enormous depth um, the uh, classical idea of God, which, of course, is uh, in the Summa Theologica, he explicitly acknowledges his debt to uh, both, of, supremely, of course, Aristotle, uh, which we're enormously grateful to the Islamic world for preserving that part of the Aristotelian corpus on which he drew, but also to Muslim theologians. I mean, it's quite clear, and to Jewish theologians, it's quite clear that uh, Aquinas actually did learn from the conversations about divine simplicity, for example, from a Muslim theologian, which he then used in his own understanding of God. And David Burrell, in his excellent work, documents this, I think, superbly well. And so therefore that work of, uh, okay, here we are, puny little creatures in a massive universe made up of billions of planets and solar systems and uh, galaxies trying to work out what the ultimate creator's night like. There is something very healthy about recognizing that work should be done, drawing on, um, on a range of conversation partners uh, across traditions. And, and I think that that is actually sound orthodox Christian theology, methodologically. I mean, Augustine of Hippo, I mean, what, what was his primary inspiration? It was Plotinus and Neoplatonism. And Plato just reminded us all, wasn't exactly, a, you know, a card-carrying baptized Christian. So, so we were all in the business of this, and the, the tradition always has been. And in one sense, carry on doing that is, is an act of fidelity to Christianity. You're not betraying the tradition when you think in those sorts of ways at all. Um, uh, Norsi is, is very classical. I mean, he, he, he would, so, so divine immutability is there. I mean, it's a very, um, basically, I think what's happened in the history of ideas when it comes to God, there are those which stress God's distance from the creation. And Norsi's in that school of thought and those which stress God's closeness to the creation, the imminence of God, the imminence of transcendence. Um, and there are Muslim thinkers, actually, who, who talk in very radical ways about God's imminence in creation. Um, so that conversation continues in traditions, across traditions, amongst theologians, and, and actually, you know, th those two differences are still very much there. I, I tend to think that um, the Trinity is an interesting one. I mean, Trinity is clearly a major issue in the Christian-Muslim dialogue. Um, and, and that is a, uh, I mean, but Christians often don't help here because we're not very good at explaining what the tradition claims about the Trinity. Um, uh, and, and I think we can and should be much more imaginative about that conversation. I mean, I think the most important, Thomas Michel, 
the, the Jesuit theologians, I think, has been helpful here when he stresses that the, the dilemma that Christians face is comparable to the one that Muslims face. Both traditions said the eternal word must be eternal because God doesn't just arbitrarily start speaking. So for Muslims, that's the Quran. That's the eternal word, and it must be eternal. Pre-exist creation, as you heard from Saeed Norsi, and I quoted just a moment ago. Christians actually said the same thing, but we locate the eternal word not in a text, but in a life. And we then said the same thing. The eternal word must be eternal and pre-exist creation. And of course, the doctrine of the Trinity for Christians was the Christian way of safeguarding monotheism. So we wanted to make sure the eternal word and the creator are wrapped together. So we talk about God as triune, the, the eternal word aspect of God, the creatorial aspect of God, and of course, the third person of the Trinity, that aspect of God that makes God present to us now, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Those three things, we didn't want three bits of God hanging around, so the Trinity was always the Christian way of hanging on to monotheism. While, um, so, so, and once you start talking in these sorts of ways, we face the same problem. This is how Christians solved it. I think that's a very healthy way to think through the relationship of the, 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 to discuss the Trinity with Muslims. Are you chairing? Are you going to point to somebody, Sharon? Well, he had his hand up first. We're going to <laughs> and the mic's near you, And the I mic think. is near yeah. you, yeah. Could you stand up, please? Uh, Reverend Markham, I've been listening to you with great interest on almost everything you've said, but uh, since I was born in India and grew up there, I was totally riveted about what you had to say about um, Indian Muslim Christian relation, I'm sorry, Muslim Christian Hindu relations. And I found your remarks to be extremely acute and bringing us to a point where we can proceed further in the discussion. Um, I was raised in a Hindu background. I never felt very committed to Hinduism or any uh, major aspect of it. Uh, and I went to secular schools, so-called, and even some Anglican schools, where, <laughs> where, where we had house, house system and prefects and cricket games and so on. Uh, and Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, Sikhs, everybody uh, on the same team. Uh, our leg spinner was a, a Muslim, and I was captain. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and I'm rooting for England for the ashes. Thank you. I really <laughs> appreciate that. We need the help. One of the things, I just want to be very brief, um, the Hindus have this monopolizing tendency. You see, it's, it's, it's us, uh, we Hindus, Jains, Buddhists, and other minority Sikhs, and all. we're all together, we're one nation. Mm -hmm. But those Muslims are the outsiders. Yeah. Uh, and this is very analogous to the German situation where, um, you know, everybody was one nation except for, you know, who, and let's go get them, mm -hmm. you see. So the, the, the Muslims are unfortunately in the vulnerable position of being uh, a minority under uh, a very uh, ugly seeming sometimes majority. Uh, and, and, and this is political and economic. Um, you mentioned how the um, interfaith structures seem to lead to a peaceful uh, atmosphere. Well, I would suggest there that there's an economic basis to that structure, which means that Muslims are already well represented with the Hindus because they're economically and in other ways culturally perhaps successful. Whereas where the riots break out and there are pogroms, um, to borrow a Russian word, um, it, it's not the case. And, and you have desperately poor and weak people on whom it's very easy to aggress. I wonder if that thesis will play and Perhaps uh, somebody can work at it. I can't. I'm too busy. Uh, <laughs> I have another very disparate uh, comment, please. Um, uh, you mentioned how uh, we can read uh, Sayyid Nusri um, as a, a Muslim, di uh, did you say, dialogian? Theologian, uh, dialogian. Someone you have yeah. with. Yeah. 
Conversation partner. Conversation partner, yeah. indeed. Um, all recur. Um, That's sorry. right. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there happens to be a, a, a Jewish teacher friend of mine. I got interested in Judaism about 20 years ago over some little project I was doing. I felt I had to brush up on Jewish thought. And uh, the man that I ended up turning to uh, became my teacher. He's a solidly rooted, as you said, you use the Alistair McIntyre mm -hmm. phrase. Uh, if I may ask you to remind us. Uh, Tradition constituted. Indeed. Yeah. Traditional constituted theologian. Yeah. Well, uh, that fits the description of the person I'm talking about. His name is Jose Faul. Mm -hmm. He has apparently her earned the title of Hacham in Hebrew, which means uh, even above rabbi, like rabbi of rabbis. Mm. And he's my friend. And, th and he writes these uh, very interesting books, the latest of which is called The Horizontal Society, Understanding the Covenant and Alphabetical Judaism. His point is that the way the Torah is written without vowels mm. oh. uh, implies a, a different sort of concept of divine writing or revelation, uh, where we go write the word of God with God by supplying the vowels, which mm. change meanings and tenses and implications and mm. so forth. Uh, so <coughs> well, with that basis, uh, he's written a whole series of books which may make uh, a good dialogical, mm. uh, what should I call it, uh, library, a little mm. bookshelf that we can, along with people like Nusri, yeah. Thank you very much. No, thank you for both those comments uh, and, and, and for the richness of them. Um, and thank you especially for rooting for England in the ashes. I appreciate that a great deal. For <laughs> the Americans unaware of what that is, that's the great rivalry between Australia and England in cricket. Um, the, the, uh, the one enormous dynamic, of course, in, in the um, Hindu-Muslim relationship in, in, in India is, is the relationship with Pakistan and Kashmir in particular. And, and that is, um, that, that's part of the deep uh, complexities of, of that particular con conversation, which is one of the reasons why the context is hugely important and you acknowledge all these complexities in that, in that place. Uh, and then finally, thank you for the suggestion of the name, and I, I agree with you. There are, there yeah. are, what's good is that yeah. uh, we're at a, moving into a place where I think people, you know, the Hans Kung type approach to interfaith dialogue, which was much more global, or John Hick, the Englishman who organized the pluralist hypothesis and so on. I think that approach has almost had its day, and we're now much more searching for people who come out of a tradition and because of their fidelity to that tradition can give good reasons for going into the conversation and then once in the conversation let the conversation go where God takes mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. and and that in one sense is much closer I mean Thomas Aquinas said horrible things about Muslims so let's not set him up as a model but he managed to have his horrible things about Muslims while at the same time reading them and taking them very seriously now let's Let's get back to respect. So we'll, we'll get rid of the horrible things that Thomas Quine said about Muslim at the start of Contra uh, Gentili um, and, and focus much, much more on, so let's have respect, but let's also have rootedness and in place and, and then seeing where the conversation goes. Yes, please. Hi, I've been involved in what you called grassroots interfaith dialogue, first in Germany and now for the past two years here in Washington, D.C. for a while now. And it's been my impression that usually once you have people of faith together, they can agree about the importance of faith and they can find that course of action to take together to improve the community. Um, but where it gets difficult, and that's something I see in the so-called dialogue between Islam and the West, is when you have people who don't place much importance in faith or who are non-believers, explicit non-believers themselves, debating people of faith. So I was wondering whether you could, whether you could design some kind of a structure that will include both secularists or atheists mm -hmm. and people of faith in a mutual dialogue to improve the community that we mm -hmm. all live in together. I think that's a, a very good and interesting question. Um, 
I mean, America is so f odd, isn't it, really? Because, you know, you think about the bestseller list over the next last 10 years or whatever. You've had the Christopher Hitch and Sam, uh, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris do very, very well from the atheistic, secular, humanist end of the spectrum. You've had running parallel with that, the sort of left behind phenomenon, mm -hmm. the, the 60 million copies now which have been sold, uh, fictional portrayal of the end of the age, American fundamentalist, evangelical fundamentalism. Um, and, and that speaks to America's, one, the one joy of America is how do you get both of those groups to the table? How do you encourage evangelical fundamentalists to join the conversation? And quite a lot of Islamophobia is coming from that that group. And how do you get Sam Harris, who's written, I think, really cruel things about Islam in his book. So how do you get both those constituencies at the table? And I think that's a good challenge. I mean, I, and I think it's an important one to try and do. Um, uh, and, and learning to honor the voices on both spectrums, learning to understand the deep commitments of piety and love of Jesus that sort of inspires uh, evangelical fundamentalism and, and understand the sort of commitment to enlightenment values and toleration and feminism and gay rights that often inspires uh, secular humanism and, and recognizing strength and in, in those conversations. I think the key to all this is A, finding interlocutors willing to come to the table, B, making sure that they're given plenty of space to actually explain their understanding of the world. And one of the best ways of doing this is story. I mean, we're, 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 we're shaped by who we are and the families we were brought up into and the background we had and the games we played and the places we've lived and the languages we learned and the values we start appreciating and the impact of parents and so on. So letting all that be part of the conversation. Um, and, and then, uh, yes, finding ways of... Um, allowing the difference to be recognized and then moving beyond it. So you don't, don't deny it. I mean, I'm not, I'm not into interfaith dialogues where secular humanists meet people of faith and all they do is debate whether or not it's true. Mm. I'm also not into dialogues where they meet and they never talk about it. The secret is to meet, spend some time talking about it, and that can be very enjoyable, very rich. And often in the process of that, you know, the secular humanist learns that the sorts of gods they don't believe in, some of their interlocutors don't believe in as well, and so yeah. therefore it moves the conversation to a different place. Um, and, and, and some of the, you know, believers have not actually listened to somebody who says, look, mm -hmm. one major reason why I'm committed to this is for certain ethical reasons, which, you know, I think are important to recognize and, and, and celebrate. So you can have all sorts of quite healthy dynamics. The secret is to allow it to be aired, but not allow it to be the only thing which is aired. And then to really think a little bit about how we coexist and live together with disagreement. It's a, single, it's a hugely difficult question. I mean, I, the, the dynamic and power of intolerance, you know, and tolerance is a very interesting concept because you tolerate, tolerate, okay, so you've got a spectrum. You've got love and acceptance this end of the spectrum you've got hatred and hostility at that end of the spectrum. Tolerance isn't love and acceptance. When you use the word tolerate, it means you disagree, you think they're mistaken, but you allow them. Now, actually, it's, it's a very begrudging allowance as well. You know, so it's, it's a very, but it's a very important con concept for this world to get its head around. And working out reasons why you tolerate is actually really, really difficult for people. <laughs> we all find it difficult. We all want to draw a line too quickly that we disagree and therefore we have to hate or be hostile to. Finding ways of living with disagreement in a constructive way is, I think, very, very important. Well, I think we need to conclude our time together. I just want to thank you. and. Uh, sort of reflect on our conversation today. I, I'm thinking back of stories and how we were raised and my mother who was a faithful Anglican from Canada always taught me never talk to friends about race, religion, or politics. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of the guiding principle of polite behavior. Well that was many years ago now and we are in a different place in our culture, in our globe. 
Um, and I, I believe that this is a God thing, that God is cracking open what we once thought were polite ways of uh, regarding each other because they were shallow. Yeah. Um, and they were insincere, actually, and false. Um, but now we're genuinely learning about each other and discovering a deeper level of relationship with our neighbor. So you can't love your neighbor if you don't know your neighbor. Um, so I think we're in a wonderful period of time in the dialogues that are engaging between, between religions. But I think you've raised an interesting point. How do we engage the secular, the humanist, and the, the, the non-believer um, in that comes in not to convert them, but to listen to them? I thank you for gathering us together, and I thank you, Dr. Markham, for oh, yeah. enlightening us with Dr. Mr. Nurse. Thank you very much.